Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Brian. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have uh, been dealing with the subject of prayer, but it's not just prayer. Uh, the last several weeks. And tonight we're going to get into prayer and fasting. In just a few moments, people want to know a lot of times why fast and should we fast today in the day that we live. I, I'm going to be talking about some things in a few minutes here that may sound a little foreign uh, to some folks. And the reason why, um, it is not some strange doctrine, believe me. It's just that it's not taught. It's just not taught. So we're going to be getting into some things here. And I, I hope that you'll open your hearts uh, to the Word of God. But in Matthew in chapter 17, I'll begin to read with the 14th verse. Matthew chapter 17, and we'll start with the 14th verse here. Matthew 17, it's talking about a boy that is healed. And it said, And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, that's to Jesus, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. They they couldn't heal him. And then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately. Now, they're curious about this. So they wait and they come and they go to the Lord after the crowd dwindles away. And they go to Jesus in private and they said this, Why could we not cast it out? Now, Jesus had given them power before to heal the sick and cast out demons. But in this particular case, they could not cast this demon out of this boy. In verse 20, so Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. Interesting now. He would have offended 90% of the church today when he said faithless and perverse generation. And now he says, because of your unbelief, most of the deacon board would have split, found another church. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Anybody ever seen a mustard seed before? It is very, very small. A mustard seed is small. He said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, verse 21, this kind does not go go out except by prayer and fasting. It does not, he's talking about that demon-possessed boy, that demon would not leave that boy unless, in this case except by prayer and fasting. Now, let me ask, you know, the question is, you know, well, do, do people, are people, some people, I mean, do they still have demon possession today? Yes, they do. Absolutely, they do. And I, I know we're somewhat protected here in America, but it, it's, it's, we're, we're losing that uh, protection slowly in America. But we've been in other countries and you can sense the powers of darkness very, very strongly, very real. Um, not that you can't hear. You can. But there are powers of darkness and people that are demon-possessed. And the only cure is Jesus Christ. There's no uh, prescription drug. There's nothing like that that will deliver a person. Uh, only the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I will say this, and, is that I believe that in this day and age, the, the media age and, and the the type of movies that Hollywood is putting out, the, the don't get upset with me, but this Harry Potter thing and the, uh, the, the what is it, the, you're, you're a, you're, what's the other thing that they're, they're this coming to be, Dracula or whatever, a vampire, and this type, type of thing, and, um, and these blood uh, things, that, the games that, you know, glorify blood and murder. It, what happens is Satan is slowly getting into the hearts of the children, He's trying to destroy the simplicity of their hearts. The, the, and, and they open their heart to these things. They open their soul to these things. And uh, there, there are great consequences that can take place because of that. Does that mean every person that 
that watches those as demon possessed. No, I'm not saying that whatsoever. But I do believe that it is possible that Satan can enter in, that uh, demonic spirits can influence. The Bible says that we, we, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The word sway means influence. The whole world lies under the influence of Satan. Now, not for us that are saved. We have been delivered. Satan doesn't have power over us. Uh, is the spiritual world very real? Yes, it is very real. We can talk about that in another night as a, a subject of matter. Uh, in Ephesians in chapter 6, we can talk about the armor of God and in the spirit world. It is very real. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, the Bible says. It's not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. There are spiritual uh, attacks against the child of God. And it is imperative that the, the Christian prays and that we also uh, fast. Now, last week we talked about the inner man. And we said a few things about the inner man. And we said that he can see. We said the inner man can hear. We said that he can taste. He can feel. And he must be exercised. He must be cleansed. And he also must be fed. And we talked about those. We took the whole night dealing with that. And uh, if you'd like to get that CD, maybe you could see Brother John and he can make one for you. Uh, but the outer man, we know this. The outer man is perishing. The outer man is what you know me by. You see my gray hair. You see my wrinkled skin. Uh, you see that I'm getting older. Uh, can't quite do the things I used to do when I was younger. Uh, but nevertheless, the outer man, the Bible said, is perishing. But the inner man, and when we say the inner man, we mean that the spiritual man, the spiritual man can be renewed spiritually in spite of the outward physical decay. Now, my outward body cannot do maybe some of the things that used to do. I can't run like I used to run. I can't quite physically go the distance that I used to go. But my spiritual man can. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. And that is speaking spiritually that inner man can be renewed. Second Corinthians in chapter 4 and verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Have you ever lost a little bit of heart because your outward man is perishing? When you realize that your son can out lift weights, he can outrun you. <laughs> Things like that, I start getting a little discouraged. I'm going, you know, I'm getting a little old. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4 and 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is what? Being renewed year by year. The outward man is being renewed year by year. Is that what it says? Are you sure? Day by, oh, day by day. The outward man, the inward man is being renewed day by day. By day. That means that we can have a spiritual renewing or strengthening in that inner man. So I know this, that the inner man needs strengthening. The strengthening comes by what? Holy communion and prayer with your Heavenly Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul knew that prayer made a difference. Now, I, I know that my inner man needs strengthening. I know that. My outer man might be weak, but if my inner man is strengthened, I'm okay. If your inner man is strengthened, you won't bite the head off of somebody. You won't get quite so ouchy. Husbands and wives might not fight so much. If we would spend time renewing the inner man by spending time in prayer, spending time in the Word. Let's just be real honest. I would say that a great deal of the church today, no matter how much activity they have and how wonderful they may look in the outer appearance, how many people really spend time in prayer? And if they do spend time in prayer, how, how much time are they spending really praying according to the Spirit of God or the will of God? Or how much time are they spending on their own selfish desires? James says, you know, you don't have anything because you don't ask. He said, and when you do ask, you, you ask amiss because you're asking for your own selfish desires rather than according to the will of God and the Spirit of the Lord. Sometimes it takes me a while to pray just to find what the will of God is. Sometimes it's not asking God anything. It's just waiting on the Lord and praying and asking God what His will is in that situation. I know people ask you to pray and that's okay, you know, and I'll pray. But a lot of times I, I want the Lord, I want the mind of God, I want the, the Lord to tell me and to reveal to me how to pray about this person that's laying on their back in the hospital or to pray about that person or this situation. 
A lot of times we're praying for God to release us from the burden that we might be comforted from the stress that we're going through. And God is saying, you don't understand. I'm using that to win a soul. I'm using that to try to reach somebody that they might finally say yes and accept my Son as their Lord and Savior. Now, it's important that we pray. It's going to help you in your spiritual growth with God. If we don't spend time with prayer, then it stops the growth. The growth stops. And so we have to take time. Folks, we take time for everything else. Do you take time to eat? Anybody here take time to eat? Okay, you take time. Let me ask you, do you take time to sleep? (laughs) Do you take time to, to, to take a bath or take a shower or to get ready for the day? You take time for work. Do you take time for work? Do you take time to take care of your house, take care of your bills, take care of your pets? But yet, we don't take time to take care of the inner man. And a lot of times we care more about the pet. Now, I love pets. Don't get me wrong. I, I, have, a, I have a puppy that thinks it's human. Don't, don't, don't worry. You know, she thinks she, I mean, you know, she thinks she's human. She really, I think she understands some things we say. But the thing is, is that that inner man's more important than that pet. Amen? That inner man needs to be nourished. That inner man needs to be fed. That inner man needs to be cleansed. That inner man needs to be renewed. It needs strengthening. Now, it's very important that we take the time. If not, then we'll faint. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not faint. Now, I don't want to discourage you from praying. I'm trying to encourage you. I'm trying to stimulate your prayer life. Amen? If you don't have a prayer life, then I pray that you'll have a prayer life as we go through these lessons and this teaching about prayer. It's important that we spend time. It it would help us uh, build our spiritual resistance up. If we would pray, a lot of times we say, you know, my resistance is low. And so what do you do? You start taking a multivitamin, you start taking vitamin C, you start, you know, taking zinc, you start drinking orange juice, and you're trying to build up your your physical resistance against uh, some of these diseases and viruses so you don't get sick. Well, there is a spiritual resistance that we need to build up. A, the inner man needs to be strengthened. And so this is the best vitamin C and orange juice you're going to get right here is the Word of God and spending time in Holy Communion with God. I see the importance of prayer just from Jesus' own words. Jesus was a man of prayer. Many times he'd go to a lonely place and pray. He would even separate himself from his own disciples, his 12 disciples. He would even separate himself from them and go find a lonely place to pray to the Father. Now, Jesus, you say, why did he have to pray? Because he is God. Well, yeah, he's God, but he's 100% man. He's 100% God. Jesus did not lay aside his deity. He was always God, but he did lay aside uh, in the sense of, um, how, how do I say this tonight? He laid, he laid, he laid aside, uh, he, on earth he was like, he's 100% man, and he walked as man full of the Holy Spirit. He's always God, but on earth he walked as a man full of the Holy Ghost that he might lead us and he might guide us and show us by example of what it is to be a man or a woman of God. Now, many times he would go to a lonely place and pray. Sometimes you just got to pull away from it all. You got to get away from it all. And um, he, he laid aside the expression of his deity. That's the word I was trying to say. He never laid aside his deity, but he laid aside the expression of his deity. In other words, he did everything as a man full of the Holy Spirit, just like we can as the church of the living God. But we need to pull away from the hustle and bustle of life and spend time with the Lord uh, in, in, in holy communion and in prayer. Now, listen, I'm not saved just by praying, I'm not saved just by going to church. I'm not saved by reciting prayers or creeds. I'm not saved just because I give in the offering. I'm saved because of the precious blood of Jesus. You see, it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. I'm saved by the blood. Also, we are kept by the blood. It is by the blood that our prayers are not only possible, but also they are powerful. See, I think the reason a lot of times we don't pray or we don't spend that time in prayer, is because we don't realize how powerful prayer is. Prayer is powerful. Why? Because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, the fire on the altar of incense. Now, I've told this to you before. In the Old Testament, you'd see the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, you'd walk in, and on the right would be the table of showbread. The bread represents Jesus Christ. He said He is the bread of life. 
On the left would be the candlestick, which was made out of one solid piece of gold. And the stem would come up and would branch off three branches on each side, one in the very middle, seven candles, seven bowls, had oil in it, and the light was lit. He is the light of the world. The gold stands for purity and also the fact that He is God Almighty. He is divine. The oil always represents the Holy Spirit. You have the candlestick on the left and you walked in and right there before the Holy of Holies there was a curtain. And behind the Holy of Holies was another room. And in that room was the Ark of the Covenant. You had the, the seraphim over that and the mercy seat on top of the Ark the wooden box, and there was the presence of God dwelt between the mercy seat and the cherubim, or the cherubim and the mercy seat. But on this side of the curtain, just before the, the Holy of Holies, that room, was an altar. And on that altar, the priest would come, and he would burn incense, and that incense was a type of prayer. It was prayer being offered up before the Lord. The priest was to take the fire from the brazen altar. The brazen altar is a type of Christ. Uh, Jesus took uh, our sin upon Himself and that sin was judged. That brazen altar is a type of Christ. The priest always had to take the fire from the brazen altar and he would have to light the incense when he'd offer a prayer before the Lord. The smoke would go up, the incense would go up to the top of the tabernacle and then it would float back over the curtain that was there, which had the picture of seraphim over the curtain. It would go back into the Holy of Holies. Now, in the Old Testament, we see that Nadab and Abihu, they were stricken dead by the judgment of God because they lit the altar of incense with fire that was not from the brazen altar. They took fire from another place and they tried to offer that incense before God. God would not accept it. The Bible said He did not recognize it, that it was profane fire. Now, understand what God is trying to show us. And God is saying this, that He will not recognize, amen, coming, try, somebody trying to come to heaven any other way than through Jesus Christ. It has to be through His Son. It's not going to be this way or that way. The only way God will accept us, the only way God will hear us, will be through His Son who gave His life the perfect sacrifice for our sin. The fire on the altar of incense was lit from the fire that was on that brazen altar. Now I make the connection. If it were not for the cross, your prayers and my prayers wouldn't mean a thing. But because of the cross... They are effective. It's because of the blood that I'm able to come into that throne room of grace. Now, let's turn to the book of Hebrews tonight. Hebrews, toward the back of your Bible, in chapter 10. If you want to understand a little bit about the history of the Old Testament, you'll want to read the book of Hebrews. Very powerful. Hebrews in chapter 10. And let's look at verse 19. And it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. We can go before the throne of God right now. You and I can, not because of us, but because of Him. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, well, I really don't feel like praying. It doesn't matter what you feel like. But we come to God by faith through, uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did for us. Verse 20, By a new and living way which He consecrated for us, through the veil, that is His flesh. Now, understand that when Jesus was crucified on the cross, the veil was torn in half from top to bottom. Amen? We come to God now in new and a living way. It's not through the Old Testament sacrifices. We don't need to bring and shed the blood of an animal to come to God anymore because the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice has been given the blood of Jesus Christ. So now we come by faith He says, by a new and a living way, which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is His flesh, and having a high priest, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. So now we can come to God. 
Not based on our works, not based on our merits, not based on what we have done, but faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, faith in what He has already done for us at Calvary. Jesus paid the price. The veil has been torn in half from the holy place to the holy of holies. We now come to God in a new and a living way. We don't have to bring an animal or any kind of sacrifice like that and shed the blood of of an animal anymore. Uh, The perfect sacrifice has been given. Jesus Himself. So now what do we do? We come to God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, by faith. And we can have this full assurance. We can have this confidence to know that this is the way of God. This is the way of the Lord as the Bible teaches us. If prayer was right then, it's right now. If prayer was seen by Jesus to be indispensable back then, then it's indispensable right now. If it was, if it was effectual then, it's effectual now. So in other words, I want you to be encouraged uh, that we can pray. We can seek the face of God. Start now. Start today. It doesn't matter about the eloquence of your words. It's your honesty with the Father. He hears. He answers. And what else does He, does he do? But yet He strengthens. And so if you find yourself being a little weak or a little discouraged, then we can go to the Lord and we can pray and we can seek the face of God. Amen? Prayer is a good thing. Prayer with Time with God is never time wasted. Now, now, I, I want to, I let's, let's talk about this tonight, about fasting. Uh, we must be, I know we must be a people of prayer. And if we don't have a constant prayer life, then, then how can we be a spiritual people? I'm going to throw some questions out to you. And I want, I'm going to cause you to think a little bit tonight. But it, how can we be a spiritual people if we don't spend time in communion with God? How can we have the mind of Christ? How can we have the mind of the Lord or the mind of the Spirit? How can we be filled with the Spirit of God if we don't spend time in communion with God, in prayer with the Lord? Now, not only does God want us to have a prayer life, but God wants us to be consistent in our praying. Not just praying maybe on Sunday, okay? Well, it's good to pray on Sunday, but... There's also Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. <laughs> There's other days. You can pray. You can talk to the Lord driving down the street in your car, in your kitchen, cleaning your house, at work, wherever you are. We can meditate, ponder, think about the Lord. We can talk to the Lord. And those are good times and good places to talk to the Lord. But also there is that prayer closet that we can get away from everything, pull away from the disciples, so to speak, and spend time with the Lord. How can we be spiritual if we don't spend time in prayer? Prayer helps us do a few things. It helps us to line our will up with His will. A lot of times we think we know what's best until we go to the Lord in prayer and only find out that we don't know what's best. So it helps us to line our will up with His. Prayer helps us to be in tune with God. I want to be in tune with God. And sometimes we're more in tune with God than at other times. And I remember the younger kids... Yeah... Antonia, you won't remember. Do you, the old dial radios. Do you remember, do you, do you remember dial radios? No, she's, this is terrible. Okay, this, now it's push button. goes right to a channel, right? You can push seek and go right to a channel, right? The clearest channel or the strongest channel that you can get. When I was growing up, they had records. Do you remember the records? The 45s, the 72s, the 33s? Or You remember those records? Do you remember the, do you remember the four-track tapes? Does anybody remember the four-track tapes? Eight track. You remember eight track? Reel to reel. Anybody remember reel to reel? (laughs) Trying to tell your age. (laughs) Well, you know, I remember having a car and I had the dial. And, you know, you you can hear the station, but it was a little fuzzy. You couldn't quite hear it. And so you turn the dial just to kind of hone in on that station so that you can get a clear signal and you can hear the music. And a lot of times, you know, we, we think we might be hearing God, but we're not quite sure. It's a little staticky. It's a little fuzzy. It's just not quite as clear as it could be. And we kind of have to hone in, turn the dial a little bit, and hone in on that channel that we might get a clear signal that we might hear from God. I'm telling you, folks, God's on one channel. The church is on the other. Don't get upset with me. I'm telling you. God's going that way. The church is going that way. And it says, oh, isn't this wonderful? We have the Lord. And God says, hey, hey, uh, over here. But it can't hear the Lord because it's listening to another channel. Ask me later how I really feel about it. I'm telling you, it's walking to a different beat, a different step. It's on a different station, a different channel, and yet it thinks it's hearing God. Well, listen, my beloved, there are a lot of voices these days. We better make sure that we hear the voice of the Lord, but understand that His voice will always line up with this book. 
And I know it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major controversy of this day and the direction I believe I see. That's why this church is not real big. That is why this church, if, if I were to compromise and give in to the flesh and give in to what everybody wanted to do, we'd have a, a fun time. Well, we'd have a circus, but you wouldn't have any substance from the Word of God. There'd be no spiritual growth and you'd be biting one another's heads off. You'd be operating and thinking out of the flesh. Yeah, I hate to say it, but you have churches today. They're just, they're, they're, they're full of sin. I mean, this person leaves that person, goes after that person, that person goes after this person, and you have all this kind of thing. And usually it starts from the pulpit. Usually it's the pastor. It's the pastor cheating and the pastor not being faithful. And so why? Because they operate out of the flesh. They, they're, now there is spiritual war, and I understand all of this. But listen, we can't say, well, you know, well, you, know again, you can't blame it on the devil. Well, the devil made me do it. Well, the devil didn't make you. He tempted you, but he didn't force you unless you're demon-possessed. Are you saying you're demon-possessed? No, I'm not demon-possessed. Well, then the devil didn't make you do it. You did it. You gave in to it. No, he tempted you. Yes. Let me ask you this. Has anybody in this place ever been tempted by the devil? Be honest. Have you ever been tempted by the devil? Of course we have. But it's still ultimately up to your choice whether you give in to that temptation or not, right? Thank you. I'm starting to feel bad there for a moment. <laughs> okay, so, so prayer helps us line our will up with Him to be in tune with God. And it helps us to keep us on the same frequency. And it, prayer shows our dependency on God. It says we can't do it by ourselves. Prayer is an act of humility. Remember we said in Second Chronicles 7 and 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves... And then what? And go shopping? No. And pray. So it's an act of humility because you have to humble yourself before the Lord. Uh, It's communication with God. It gives the Lord opportunity to speak to our hearts. It shows less reliance on ourselves and more upon Him. John the Baptist said, He must increase and I must decrease. That means that self has to get out of here. Self has to get out of the way. And He must increase in my life. And that's would I pray that God would increase in me and I would decrease. Mark Malden would get out of the picture. Amen. You would see the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want people to say, oh, isn't... And the temptation is there. Oh, isn't He a wonderful preacher? Oh, He can just... Oh, He's wonderful. But the problem is, is when you hear the name of the preacher more than you hear the name of Jesus. That's a problem. And that's a temptation that preachers have to be aware of. It doesn't matter whether you can preach or not. Does it really matter? What matters is, is God glorified? Are people hearing the word? Are they responding? Are they being convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit? Are they being drawn to the Lord? Are they being drawn to a man? See, if they're being drawn to a man, it won't work. They have to be drawn to Christ. They have to be drawn to the Lord. I would hope that that if if for some reason I wasn't here anymore in this church, that, that this church would continue. I would hope that it would. I'm not going anywhere. Don't worry. <laughs> I, it's quiet. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not thinking about going anywhere. I'm thinking about building, okay? So I, I'm, just, you know, I, I'm just saying that, that, but it has to be, I know you love me, but it has to be Christ that you love above me. I know you're loyal, but you've got to be loyal to Christ. I know you're faithful, but you've got to be faithful to Jesus. Okay, yes, ma'am. It is holy communion with the Lord. It is a holy time with God. A consecrated time. Yes. Yeah, what would you say? He, well, I had a physical problem this week, uh, uh, just to interject, and, uh, and the Lord is praying, and He will speak to you. He said, take the same medicine that you tell other people. Yeah, that's good. You see? But that's I good. I would not have been able, able to hear that as right. I if I had not had that communion. That's right. That's right. That's right. So in other words, what you're saying is it gave God uh, an opportunity to speak to your heart. Yeah. And that's, that's what it is. God giving him, it shows, uh, gives an opportunity. It shows we're less reliance upon ourselves. Prayer says that we want God's will to be done, not our will. And if the church is to have the power of God flow through it, then it must be a church that will bend the knee in prayer. Um, now, in our text here this evening, Jesus not only talked about prayer, but also he mentioned fasting. Now, he said this. He said, um, 
This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, I, I know that this is a controversial verse. If you go studying in uh, commentaries and you read after different theologians, you're going to find that this is a very controversial verse. Now, in some translations, verse 21 isn't there. Now, if you have an NIV Bible here, then you'll find that verse 21 is probably not there. Anybody here have an NIV? Okay. 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 All right. All right. So we're going to have to flog you tonight. No, just kidding. No. no. Um, that verse isn't there, is it? That's not there. Okay. Interesting, isn't it? Now, okay. Let me explain that. Okay. Are you all curious? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it next week. I've got to wrap it up tonight. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about this tonight. Verse 21 is not there in the NIV. At least in the newer NIV. Now, let me, the NIV is the, uh, the New International Version. Now, I'm not saying it's a sin to have an NIV. You can read the NIV if you want. I use the NIV as a commentary, not really as a study Bible. Now, let me just give you a little bit of insight about this. The NIV used to be owned by a Christian copyright company. They're not any longer owned by a Christian copyright company. Uh, a non-Christian organization owns the copyright to the NIV. They can change anything they want without you knowing it and without your permission. So just to give you that heads up on the NIV. I don't know about the other translations, but I do know the NIV is that way. used to not be that way, but it is now. I have an old, old, I have a 20-year-old NIV translation. It's better than the new ones they have today because it has some of these verses that they have taken out. Now, verse 21 is not in some of the newer translations. The reason some chose not to put that verse in the Bible is because of this. In most manuscripts, it's not there. In most manuscripts, it's not there, but in some manuscripts, it is there. Now, the interesting thing is that most of your newer translations are taken from a revised Greek manuscript, okay? The original copies, I always confuse people, listen to what I'm saying. The original copies of the Greek manuscripts were revised somewhere in the 1800s. The original copies of the Greek manuscript. Your New Testament is written in Greek, Koine Greek, okay? Some of the manuscripts were broken up and they're in pieces. And through the years and through the centuries, uh, theologians and archaeologists have been finding these copies of these manuscripts. Now, over a period of time, what happens to paper? What happens to leather uh, after rain and weather gets to it? Dirt and the deposits of the earth, it begins to crumble, and so then they find these scrolls, they find these manuscripts, uh, the, the Word of God written on leather manuscripts. And so they pull them out of the dirt, and they don't just roll them out and read it, it'll crumble to pieces. So they have to slowly take and unroll it, and they go through the process trying to preserve the original copies of the Greek manuscripts in which our Bible comes from. Now... Uh, in, in the original copies, the original copies that they have found, and they find hundreds of these, by the way, hundreds of copies buried in the ground. Um, the original copies of the Greek manuscripts were revised in the 1800s. Several thousands of words were taken out. Most of the words were taken out because they said that the words were just repetitive. So they took out some of the repetitive words. Now listen to this. The King James Version. How many have a King James Version here tonight? Okay. People say, there are people that will say, you know, they're King James only, KJV only, KJV only. And they say, if you read any other translation, then that's of the devil and all that kind of thing. No, you're welcome to read other translations if you want. But why do they stick so closely to the King James Version? Because of this. The King James Version was taken from the original copies of the Greek manuscript before the 1800s when those copies were edited. So you're going to have things in the King James Version that are going to be taken out in the NIV, the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, the ESV, English Standard Version, and things like this. The New King James, and that's what I read from you tonight, the New King James tries to preserve the King James by changing some of the these and thous and things like that, some of the old English into our contemporary English, but there are some things I wish they'd have just left alone and not touched with. But to have a copyright, you have to change 30% of the text. 
And so now what happens? Well, it's not so much about the preserving the true word of God or the authenticity of God's word, but it's about changing 30% or at least 30% of the word so that you can make a new copyright so that you can make money when you sell it. Now, I hate to tell you all that tonight, but that's where it is. So every time they come out with a new translation, they have to change at least 30% of that copy to make a new copyright. You change 30%, you change 30%, you change 30%, you change 30%, and the next thing you know, you've got nothing but water. Right. You, you, they, they've watered it down so much. And so it's about money. I hate to say that to you. It's about marketing. Not everybody that says they're Christian are Christian. Not everybody that says that they're saved are saved. There are people that are in this just for money, just for marketing, just to make a living. Okay. Now... The King James Version was taken from the original Greek manuscripts, the ones that were untouched. And it it wasn't taken from the revised version of the 1800s. The King James Version is probably your most accurate translation as far as the manuscripts are concerned. Regardless if Jesus said it or, or regardless if Jesus said it or not, we do have scriptural evidence that fasting is biblical. Now, if you want to argue about verse 21 then let's take the entirety of the Word of God. Let's not base a doctrine just on one verse. And there are denominations and there are organizations that get themselves in trouble because they try to base a doctrine on one verse. You never base a doctrine on just one verse. Understand that Scripture backs up Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. So let's not just take one verse. Let's go and look at the totality of the Word of God tonight. Is that okay? i got a few minutes tonight. you got a few minutes? Okay, first of all, let's, let's look at this. Look at Judges, and you can write it down if you want. You can go to it if you want to. Judges 20 and 26. That's way back in the Old Testament. Uh, you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy... Joshua, Judges, the seventh book of the Bible. The first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch. Five is Penta. Okay? So we get, we get Penta or five. And so the Pentateuch are the first five books of the Bible. Or we can say the book of Moses. Because most of the five books of the Bible, the first five books were written by Moses. And some argue that Moses didn't write all of it. But nevertheless, we could say the majority was probably written by Moses. Judges 20 and 26, the seventh book of the Bible. Then all the children of Israel, that is, all the people, went up and came to the house of God and wept. They came to the temple of the Lord, the tabernacle of God. That's like us coming here to the house of the Lord and weeping before God. And they sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. In the book of Judges, you'll find that the people of Israel are no different than us today, and we're no different than them. They constantly went through a cycle. And the cycle was this, is that God would deliver them, and they were set free from their enemies that would oppress them. They were the enemies, the Philistines and the the Philistines and the the Amalekites and the Amorites and all these enemies would come, and they would suppress or oppress the children of Israel. And they would be in somewhat bondage. And they would get sick and tired of being in bondage. And they would cry out to the Lord. And they would repent of their sins. And then God would raise up a judge. Or God would raise up a deliverer like Gideon, like Samson, like Deborah. God would raise them up. And they would deliver the people of Israel from their oppressors, from their enemy. They would be delivered for the next 20 or 40 years. They would be set free. And they would serve the Lord. And after a little while, after time passed by, they would slowly compromise and they would go back into sin. Sound like any... <laughs> okay, I'll just leave it there. They would go back into sin. And when they go back into sin, God would try to warn them. God would try to reach out to them. But they did their own thing. And they would slowly go back into sin. And the next thing you know, they're back in bondage. And there is an enemy. They're the Philistines. They're the Amorites, the Amatites, and the Amalekites. And they're in bondage again. And they'd be in bondage for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 60 years. And they would get sick and tired of being in bondage. And they'd cry out to the Lord. And God would raise up a deliverer. And God would deliver them. And they'd be set free for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. There was a time, perhaps maybe, when you were delivered. 
And slowly and surely, and I'm not picking on anybody here tonight. I'm just saying there's a time when you were set free, but slowly you've compromised. And little by little you go back into sin. Next thing you know, you're in this bondage and you want to get out. And so what do you do? Well, you cry out to God. What does he do? He hears your cry and he forgives you of your sin and he sets you free. And he tells you, go and sin no more. Hallelujah. Don't go back into this. I delivered you. You don't need to go back into this. You don't go back to Egypt. I delivered you out of Egypt. Why are you trying to go back there? There's nothing there. The children of Israel said, we want to go back there. It would be better off if we were there. At least, we'd be, at least we'd have our bellies full. What are you talking about? You were in bondage back there. Don't you remember the hard days and the hard times you had? You couldn't be delivered. You couldn't get set free. It had a grip of you. That sin had a vice on you. Don't you remember that? I delivered you and set you free. You crossed that Red Sea. I parted that Red Sea. I, I'm the one that destroyed the powers of darkness, the Egyptian soldiers that tried to destroy you, your home, your children. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> we find here that they cried out to the Lord. They sat before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and they offered burnt offerings. That means they're, they're repenting. To offer burnt offerings, they're repenting of their sins and peace offerings before the Lord. Now, this is what we would call a one-day fast. This was a one-day fast. If you're interested about this, in verse 26, that's a one-day fast. 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 6, Israel had returned to the Lord. Now, they had put away their false gods. And here, here they had false gods. They were worshiping false gods. You find that Israel was delivered out of Egypt. But then, you know, when Moses is up too long, and, and you know, receiving the Ten Commandments from the Lord 40 days and 40 nights... Uh, they built a golden calf. And, you know, Aaron, Moses' brother, is the one that made the thing. And, you know, he's, Moses comes down. He says, what in the world, brother, are you doing? He said, I don't know. I just threw all the gold in the fire and boom, came off this calf. It was, it was unbelievable. Yeah, uh-huh. He didn't want to take responsibility. It shows a lack of leadership. He gave in. He caved into the people. They worshipped actual physical golden idols. They would put them in their pocket. They'd put them in their home. They'd put them in their front yard as a shrine. They'd actually worship a physical, um, tangible idol. I don't need to get into that tonight, do I? We don't worship a golden idol. But we do worship a golden idol. Now, I, I like a good football game or basketball game, baseball, but I tell you, this country worships sports over God. Just, just, just let you know what happens on Super Bowl Sunday night. And now, because the church is getting tired of having empty pews on Sunday night, on Super Bowl night, so now the church just plays the Super Bowl so people will come. So we give in to that. So what we're saying is, let, listen... You don't have to stay home and watch your golden idol. You can have your golden idol here. That's what we do. The church caves in. We're no different than Aaron. We cave into this and we give them what they want rather than giving them what the word of the Lord says. Um, I know that's tough. I know that sounds hard. But I just, just trying to keep it real. Okay. Now, in 1 Samuel 7 and 6, Israel had returned to the Lord. And the Bible says, So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day. There's another one-day fast. 1 Samuel 7 and 6, there's another one-day fast. Now, the next book over, 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 12. Israel had mourned and wept and fasted until evening because of the death of Saul and his son Jonathan. So we see that in 2 Samuel chapter 1, and verse 12. The children of Israel wept and fasted until evening. I don't mean to be going too fast for you. I just, I'm just trying to show you in the Word of God. The fourth point here is Ezra was taking a group of people from Babylon to Jerusalem. Now, you've heard me preach lately about Israel being captive for 70 years because of their sin by the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar, the three Hebrew men that were thrown in the fiery furnace. Daniel was there at the time. Jeremiah was left in Jerusalem. And he was later killed for his faith in Christ. Isaiah was alive during the time. Um, and we see here that, that um, Ezra, this is after the 70 years, they're released from their captivity. One group has already gone over, and Ezra is going to take another group of Jews back over to Jerusalem. And before they went on this long, dangerous journey, they're going to travel about a 1,000 miles. They're on foot. It's going to take them about a year 
It might have taken them four months. I've got to go back and research that. It might have taken them four months, but I think the first journey took up to a year, but don't quote me on that. But just before they left, they said, So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and He answered our prayer. So before they went on this long journey, they fasted before the Lord. They brought their petition before God. They entreated the Lord. The fifth point here, Esther. You know Esther. She proclaimed for Israel to fast for three days before she would go before the king to save her people. Remember Nahum? Uh, he was going to try to, um, uh, Naaman, he was going to try to destroy uh, the people of God, the Jews. The devil is always trying to destroy God's people. And, uh, and so she had asked that the people pray for three days and fast for three days before she would go before the king because to go to the king uninvited means that you could be killed. And so she went before the king. Esther said, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. So this is a three-day fast. And that's in um, the book of Esther. Day or night for three days, they did not eat or drink anything. For three days. After Nehemiah had heard the discouraging news about the people in Jerusalem, the walls not being built. We can see this in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. The Bible says, So it was when I heard the words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So Nehemiah fasted before the Lord. We don't know exactly how many days, but he he said for many days. He fasted and prayed, wept. When Jesus was in the wilderness, the Bible said He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights without food or water, 40 days or 40 nights. Now, I've, I've known a few people that have done that. 40 days and 40 nights. Brother Clendenin was one of them. He was one of them. He's gone on to be with the Lord, but incredible, don't you think? Acts chapter 13, we see that the early church had fasted and prayed, and in that God called Paul and Barnabas on a missionary trip, a missionary journey. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, Cornelius, a Gentile, had been fasting for four days when he received a vision from the Lord. Acts 14 and 23, so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, this is the church, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7 and 5, Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. New Testament. In the Old Testament again, Daniel 10 and 3, Daniel said, I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself, nor did I anoint myself at all till there till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So we see that Daniel had prayed and fasted for 21 days. And as God was opening up the heavens, as God was revealing uh, things of the spirit world to him, uh, we can go to 2 Chronicles uh, real quick here tonight, if you want to. 2 Chronicles in chapter 20. uh, Let's look at verse 1. We see that Jehoshaphat was in trouble. He was the king of Judea. Uh, the king of Jerusalem, he was in trouble because the enemies had gathered together and they're going to fight against him. It said in verse 1, chapter 20, 2 Chronicles, it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. So this is a physical battle, but also this is a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare, if you will, that comes against the child of God. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea. From Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. That's about Kenton, where Kenton is. When he got news that the enemy was coming, they were in Kenton, and they, he was in Marion. That's how close they were. In verse 3, it says, And Jehoshaphat feared. Jehoshaphat was the king. And he feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And so we find here that the people gathered together and they fasted. It was a a church-wide fast, if you will. We've had those times, haven't we? We've had times when I've asked the church, when I felt the Lord impress it upon my heart, that we need to fast and we need to pray about a certain situation or somebody that was sick or someone 
something that was going on. And so we would pray and we would seek the Lord. So there, there's no doubt that fasting is biblical and practiced throughout the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Now, so the question is this, why fast? And, and what does it do? And what's the purpose of fasting? Well, first of all, and I, I really, I've, I've got to find a place to stop here. But first of all, why, why fast? What is the purpose of it? Let me whet your appetite just a little bit tonight. First of all, fasting is this. It is doing without food or doing without liquid. Now, personally, when I fast, it's just doing without food. I don't do without the liquid. You might just drink water or something like that. But it's separating ourselves from food. It's taking that time that you would normally spend eating your breakfast, lunch, or dinner and spending that time with God. But listen to me tonight. If you fast 10 days, it doesn't mean that God owes you anything. Amen. You see, fasting is not manipulation. Fasting is not bargaining time with God. Fasting doesn't change God. What does fasting do? It changes me. It changes us. It doesn't change God, but it changes me. Fasting is, is strictly for the purpose of this, of crucifying the old nature. Now, when I speak of the old nature, I'm talking about the fallen nature, the sinful nature, the edemic nature, okay? When we begin to deny food to the old nature then something happens pretty quickly. This is what happens to your old nature. It, it begins to weaken. Okay. And it, he, see, the old nature, the, the flesh is a food addict, if you will. It just wants to consume. It's a consumer. The flesh is a consumer. We want to consume entertainment. We want to consume everything this world has to offer tangibly. We love to consume. We like the new. We like... We, we, you know, we, we, we eat according not to our what's good for us a lot of times, but according to the taste buds. I'm guilty. Give me a Krispy Kreme donut. I like them. I mean, I tell you, they're just good. Aren't they good? I mean, I know they're not good for you, but boy, they sure are good. See, we, we, we are desire-driven. We, we, we cater to the flesh. We cater to the taste buds. We cater to what we want, what we feel, what makes us feel good, what makes us feel comfortable, what entertains us. And Hollywood is always trying to produce something bigger and better than what they had before because it's got to keep you occupied. It's got to keep you entertained. And so they're always trying to come up with something to satisfy your taste buds. You see, the old nature is a food addict. And when the old nature weakens, the lust and desires begin to die out. The new creature gains the ascendancy over the old nature. Now, we are made in the image of God. It doesn't mean that we look like God. Physically featured, we don't look like God. God is spirit. What does God look like? I don't know. I know we have pictures of what we think Jesus looks like. That was the body. That was the physical form of Jesus. And we really don't know exactly what He looks like because it changes all the time. But God is spirit and He must be worshipped in spirit and truth. So what does God look like? And the Bible gives us some description. His hair is white as wool. His eyes are flame of fire. His feet are like bronze. It talks about somewhat of His strength, of His power. What does God look like? It says that we're made in the image of God. I believe, we, I believe in the triune Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And, and I believe that we are made in the image of God in the sense that we are what is called a trichotomy. I mean, I mean, what I mean by that is, first of all, we have three parts that make up the whole. Number one, we have the body. We have the flesh. That's pretty, pretty easy to figure out because you can see me and I can see you. So we have the tangible part. We have the flesh. Secondly, we have the soul. The soulless part of us is what I believe is the old nature. It's the sinful man. The soulless part of us that we still have, by the way, even though we're born again. And then what we have, the third part, is the spirit, which is the new nature in Christ Jesus. And the three make up the whole. 
which is what we would call a trichotomy. Now, some people believe in what's called a dichotomy, which is only two parts, where the soul and spirit are one, and then you have the flesh. So they believe that you have the flesh, and then you have the soul and spirit, and they're the same, or as one, and that would be a dichotomy. And you can argue until Jesus comes. It doesn't, I don't, don't, don't get in a big debate with somebody about that. It doesn't, it, we don't need to get into that. These are, just, these are just thoughts. But personally, I believe in what they call a trichotomy. I believe that even though we're born again, and we have a new creature, we have a new nature, we've been reborn of the Spirit that communicates to God, that is what's going to go to heaven, amen, that, that we still have the old nature, we still have the soulless, S-O-U-L-I-S-H, the soulless part of us that is bent toward sin, that is bent toward doing things that are contrary to God's will in your life. Now, even though we're Christians, even though we're born again, there is that part of us that is bent toward that sin and given into sin and given into those things that do not benefit the spiritual man. Would you say amen to that? Amen. That is true. What happens when the spiritual man gets weakened? We are bent toward giving into sin, aren't we? Jesus said, and we just went through several weeks of this, Luke 18 and 1, men ought always to pray and not faint. What happens when we don't pray? We get weak. We get faint. And we have a tendency to give in to the old nature. Now, once we are saved, what happens? God begins to work in you to conform us to the image of His Son. God wants to work in us that we become more Christ-like. Now, what is this called? But progressive sanctification. When we are saved, we are set apart for the service of God. That is called we are sanctified. We are justified by faith. We are sanctified, meaning that we are separated now from the world. We are separated from sin. We're separated from Satan and we're given unto God. We belong to the Lord. We're God's property and for the service of the Lord. We are sanctified. That is an immediate action. But then also there is called progressive sanctification, which means that God begins to do an immediate work within us, inside, in our inner man, spirit man. He begins to do a work in us to conform us into the image of His Son. Not that we become God, not that we become Jesus, but that we become Christ-like. Let me take you to um, the book of Romans in chapter 8. And I've got to find a place to stop, so we've got to pick this up next week, Lord willing. Chapter 8, chapter 8 of Romans, and let's look at verse 28. And it says, um, in verse 28 of Romans chapter 8, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Now, the called are the elect. The called are the Christians. Many are called, few are chosen. God called out to us, and we responded in the affirmative. Not everybody will say yes to the Lord, but we said yes to the Lord, so now we are born again. We accepted Christ as our Savior. Verse 29, now that verse 28, we're saved. Verse 29 says, for whom he foreknew, that means that God knew you, and he knew the choice you would make way before the foundations of the world were ever created because God is not limited by time like we are. He made time. He created time. He's above and beyond time. God is eternal. God is infinite. We are finite. We're, we're, kept in the, we're, we're captive in the space of time. God is not. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed, which means it is the will of God for those that said yes to him to be conformed, shaped, molded, fashioned to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What is the purpose of God? The purpose of God is that we be conformed into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, that when people see us, they really don't see us, they see Christ. I've got to stop here, but I could, I could go online with this. I apologize. I don't mean to bore you. This, there's a lot here. But you see, God saves us, and He fills us, according to Romans 1 and 4, he, and 1 and 5, He fills, uh, he fills us, not 1, uh, 5, chapter 5, verse 5, He fills us with His love. Um, but there is a process. God begins to work in us. 
And there are things in our life that God doesn't desire and God doesn't want. And so he begins to deal with our hearts and begins sanctifying us. I remember when I first got saved. I mean, when I got saved, I mean gloriously saved. I mean, I just changed. Boom. Just changing my life. God changed me. And I thank God for it. I'll never forget Coming up on my 20-year anniversary here pretty soon. 20 years in the Lord. But I still listen to secular music. I was, I loved oldies. I was raised on oldies. I was raised on Elvis Presley and the Beatles. I was raised on all this. I mean, this is all I knew. And this is what I liked. And I was raised on this. Nobody preached it. No pastor told me. No preacher told me. But I was driving home from work one day and I was listening to... Some oldies, you know, whatever it was. And I'm a new Christian. I'm a new, I mean, I'm on fire for God. I'm telling you, I love the Lord. I'm telling everybody about Jesus. I mean, I am saved. And you can't tell me that I'm not. It's too late, like Sister Jan said. It's too late. I am saved. I know that. But all of a sudden, God began to deal with my heart on my way home. And God spoke to my heart and he says, you know, that, that music doesn't please me. And I thought, what in the world did that come from? God began to deal with my heart about this. And so I would change it. And I would change it from an oldie station to, a, to a, a Christian station. And I didn't like what they had. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I didn't like, I didn't, they didn't, I thought my oldie sounded better than what they were tooting. I mean, I really did. I just thought, you know, that doesn't sound, that was, that didn't, I don't know anything, you know. I'm just saying that doesn't sound, I don't like it either. But I was going back and forth and back and forth, God dealing with my heart. And then God began to show me the kind of music that brings Him honor and brings Him glory that will cause me to come to the Lord in a worshipful manner that would lift my soul to Him. But nobody told me that I had to do that. But God began to deal with my heart. Now, what do you call that? That is called progressive sanctification. And God is conforming me into the image of His Son. And He is trying to show me that the things that I should or shouldn't do are what pleases Him or what doesn't please Him. But if we're not in prayer and we're not in the Word and we're tuned to another station and God's trying to speak to us, how are we going to know and how are we going to hear? Or sometimes you do know better. You know better. But you choose to do what you want anyway. Has anybody ever done that before? Yes, sir. We've done that before. And it's, it, it, it doesn't feel good when we know. Isn't that, isn't that right? Now, I want to deal more with this, Lord willing, next week about fasting. I think it's going to be very helpful to you about why we fast, the purpose of it, and what it's to accomplish, and what God can do with you in that. Amen? But you know what God do? God loves you so much. You know what he's doing right now to you? He's sanctifying you. Now, if you feel convicted, don't get, don't get angry with me. I'm not trying to get you angry. I'm just trying to get us to listen to the Lord, to listen to God. God knows what's best for you. Let's stand together tonight. Brother Brian, would you come? You know what? If, if I let my kids do it, they'd eat, they'd eat candy 24-7. Yeah. I say, you know what? It's not good for you to eat all that candy. But, Daddy, it tastes so good. But it tastes so good. But I said, you know what? That's not good for you to eat all that candy. That will, that will not help you to grow up to be a healthy person. But the church has gotten into a, a, a place where it just wants candy all the time. And when a, a pastor or a preacher tries to give them the meat or something solid or something that will help them in their spiritual growth to be a healthy Christian, they, they get mad. And I see children throw fits of rage or temper tantrums. You ever seen a kid throw a temper tantrum? I've seen, I've seen the church throw temper tantrums. <laughs> I'm not saying you did. I'm just saying I've seen them get upset. But see, God's trying to do something in you right now. What's he, he's trying to conform you into his image. He's trying to change you, your attitude, your outlook, your disposition on things. Let's, let's pray tonight. You, wait, I'm sorry, you had a question? I appreciate that, sister. It's the Lord. It, it is the Lord. Yeah. The Lord is good. Amen. The Lord is good. I've kept you long enough. Let me just, let's just pray tonight. Father, 
God, we thank you, Lord, for your grace. I thank you that you love us so much that you want to change us. Lord, it all begins the the moment we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And I pray, God, that we live our lives for you. They belong to you. We're not our own anymore. We're purchased. We're bought with a price. Lord, lead us. Talk to us. Let us be in tune with you. Let us be on the right channel that we might hear your voice clearly. I pray in the name of the Lord that you would teach us your ways and the spirit of truth would lead us into all truth and we would have a revelation of your love and we'd have understanding of your purpose and of your word in our lives. I pray that God, that you would draw people to you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness in our lives. Thank you for your grace and bless your people tonight, Lord. We ask this now in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget your children. If you have questions, I'll be glad to answer. If I can, any questions you might have. (laughs) Amen. God bless you. Amen. I didn't mean to go so long, but amen. (laughs) God bless you.